I would like to introduce to you today, for those of you who have not met her yet, Elaine Mills. She's a member of the class of 2012 Master Gardener Training, whose primary interest is in sustainable gardening. She also created the first set of fact sheets on tried and true native plants that are now a popular resource on our website and which you'll be learning more about today. She has spent eight years photographing native plants in public and private gardens and enjoys selecting pictures from her photo library to illustrate her talks, articles, and weekly educational posts on our group Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter accounts. In addition, she serves as one of the coordinators for the Glen Carlin Demonstration Garden in Arlington. Welcome, Elaine, and I'm ready to turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Leslie. And I would also like to thank uh, Cheryl and Colleen, who are acting as facilitators and other master gardeners uh, working behind the scenes to support today's presentation. This is in the Sustainable Landscaping series. And as Leslie mentioned, it's uh, on best bets native plants for wet conditions. This is actually the first of, of a two-part mini-series on best bets. These are what we refer to um, as the native plants that are particularly adapted to certain conditions. So today we'll be discussing native plants for wet conditions. To give you a quick overview of the talk today, First, I'll briefly discuss some causes of wet garden conditions and describe some adaptations that plants have made to, uh, to meet these conditions. I'll briefly explain the benefits of using native plants in particular and describe how you can use the fact sheets, the tried and true fact sheets that Leslie referred to, to help you make some plant selections for your garden. Uh, so there'll be an introduction to the best bets plants for wet conditions, and those will include trees, shrubs, perennials, ferns, grasses, and sedges. And finally, I'll give you a few resources at the end of the talk. So to introduce causes for wet conditions in a garden. First, uh, this could be the result of effects of climate and seasons. Of course, we know that uh, for example, there may be a rainy season in, in the spring. Um, and we're also these days facing the uh, particular effects of climate change with especially uh, heavy rain events. Uh, wet conditions can also be the result of the texture and structure of your soil. For example, clay soil will tend to hold moisture and uh, rain will move much more quickly through sandy soil. Wet conditions can also be the result of the alignment of your home in the relation to sun and wind. So shady areas may stay a little bit uh, more wet and wind could have a drying effect. Uh, topography and water flow through your garden can uh, also cause wet conditions. Um, many of you may be facing the, the challenges of having water uh, from storm water. Uh, flowing from a neighbor's yard. And there can also be microclimates within a landscape that are cooler and or wetter. Some examples would be low-lying areas in your garden, areas at the bottom of a slope, areas beneath a downspout, and areas beside ponds and streams. Here at, uh, with Master Gardeners, we have a mantra, right plant, right place. So we're encouraging you to match uh, a given plant's light and moisture requirements to the sun exposure and the soil conditions that exist in your garden. And the plants I'll be introducing today are those that are adapted to moisture sites. Some of them can actually tolerate intermittent flooding or even grow in standing water. A number of them will help you control stormwater runoff and ponding. And they're also well suited to conditions in rain gardens, low spots, the areas near down spots and at a water's edge. There are a number of adaptations that plants have made uh, in natural habitat uh, to adjust to these wet conditions. And those particular characteristics can make them ideal for wet conditions in your own garden. Some plants uh, such as iris have shallow roots and others 
may have deep fibrous roots, such as this uh, particular rush. Some plants will have what are called pneumatophores. These are structures that form, that allow roots to, to uh, get extra oxygen. Some of the trees are fast growing and rot resistant. Some plants have flexible branches so that the uh, branches won't be torn away if there should be uh, tor uh, torrents of water in a nearby stream. Some of these plants have elongated stems to rise above standing water. And some will have narrow leaves so that they will not be battered by the rain. There are a number of benefits of using native plants in your garden in particular. They are of course suited to our local soil and climate. And beyond that, they have evolved with local fauna. So they can provide pollen, and nectar for our pollinators. They can also serve as host plants for Lepidoptera. So for example, the monarch butterfly, the adult, will feed on the nectar of the plant, but the females will lay their eggs uh, on the underside of the leaves of milkweed. And when they emerge from eggs, the caterpillars will feed on these leaves. And so these plants are referred to as larval host plants. And Lepidoptera are butterflies, moths, uh, and, and skippers and fritillaries. Native plants also provide seeds and fruit and cover for a variety of animals. I'd like to explain how you can use the handout uh, that has been sent to you. This was included in the email that gave the uh, Zoom link to the, today's presentation. This handout is uh, what we're referring to as the best bet uh, sheet for wet conditions. And this sheet can also be found on the Master Gardeners of Northern Virginia website at mgnv.org. Now on this fact sheet, you'll see a list of plants by different categories, ferns, grasses, shrubs, etc. cetera. Um, and these are ones that we have singled out that would be particularly good for wet conditions. Now you'll notice that I'm giving uh, on this sheet both the common names of the plants and the scientific name. And most of the scientific names are underlined. They're in blue and underlined. And that means that there are actually active links that will take you to more detailed fact sheets. So for example, you might be interested in looking at the fact sheet for blue vervain, verbena hastata. And if you follow that link, you would be taken to this detailed fact sheet. And this fact sheet includes in chart form all of the information that I'll be presenting today. So therefore you can actually go back and refer to this. You won't need to be taking copious notes as you listen. And when you go to the website to see these fact sheets, for many of them, you will also see some accompanying videos. Uh, these were made by Master Gardener Mary Free and they will show a lot of pollinators in action, enjoying the pollen and nectar of these plants. Colleen, do we have any questions at this point in the talk? Elaine, we have one that's a little bit off topic, but maybe you wouldn't mind answering. Someone asked, um, is there a good way or hints to removing yellow flag iris from their marsh? There, uh, if you go to the Master Gardeners of Northern Virginia website, under plants, the plants menu tab, you can arrow down and see uh, a whole set of information on invasive plants. In addition to the tried and true recommended plants, I have created a set of fact sheets on plants that have been determined to be invasive in Arlington and Alexandria. And if you go to the section on further information, you will see a number of uh, websites that provide very detailed information on how to go about removing very specific invasive plants. So I recommend that you, you look there. 
Oh, thanks, Elaine. That's very helpful. There was another question about plants that will tolerate flooding, but I think you're going to get to that later. Yes, I will be mentioning that very specifically as we go along. Okay, that's good. Thank you, Elaine. All right. So let's begin looking at these best bets plants, and we'll begin with native trees. The first is sweet gum, Liquidumbar stereciflua. flua. This is a tall, straight trunk tree, a deciduous tree. It's rapid growing, long lived and adaptable. And this particular tree favors sunny conditions and of course, moist to wet soil and prefers acidic soil. This one is an example of a tree that will actually tolerate short duration flooding and it's intolerant of alkaline soil, shade and pollution. This particular tree uh, can occasionally be severely damaged by deer, unfortunately. Uh, sweet gum provides cover and nesting sites and food for songbirds and small mammals and is a larval host plant for the Luna moth. Looking a little more closely, sweet gum provides multi-season interest. First, it has glossy star-shaped leaves, and then these will turn beautiful colors in the fall. It has very interesting um, woody seed capsules and they begin green and uh, then will turn a, a dark brown and they will remain on the tree lingering uh, through till the spring. And the tree also has corky wings that make it very distinctive. As far as planting and care tips for this tree, this particular tree is one that you're going to want to plant in spring to allow recovery from transplant shock. Uh, the, the general recommendations are actually to plant trees and shrubs, our woody plants in the fall, but this is one to plant in the spring. This one can be susceptible to iron chlorosis, a yellowing of the leaves in soil that is too basic, too alkaline. You want to allow plenty of room for root development for this tree and note that you'll want to site it away from pedestrian areas. That fruit that forms the gumballs can cause litter and uh, it could cause some human safety problems on uh, sidewalks and other types of paths. I forgot to mention that that would be uh, good for use as a shade tree. Our next tree is river birch, Betula nigra, another deciduous tree uh, around 50 to 70 feet tall. It generally comes uh, with multiple trunks. This is the more desirable uh, form of the tree. It's a fast growing tree with an irregular crown. It grows in sun to part shade, and again, prefers the moist to wet, humus rich, acidic soil. This particular tree will tolerate clay, compacted soil, as well as heat and air pollution, but is intolerant of shade. And deer will rarely damage it. It attracts birds to its seed and it serves as the larval host to multiple butterflies and moths. Another plant with multi-season interest, you'll see these catkins in the spring, attractive oval triangular leaves in the summer. And uh, a very notable feature is these exfoliating bark that peels away in papery layers. And this looks especially attractive in the wintertime set against the snow. As far as planting and care for river birch, this is one that can handle semi-aquatic conditions, but it can tolerate drier soils, as you see illustrated here in this particular landscape on the right. Another tree that you'll want to site away from paths and driveways because the, there can be a litter of the very small twigs that will fall intermittently. You'll want to use bark mulch to keep the roots of this tree cool and moist and avoid pruning it in the spring when the sap is running. This tree is attractive as a single specimen or in groups uh, in your garden, in large rain gardens, along ponds or stream banks to control erosion. And if you don't have the space for the uh, straight species, you may want to consider little king cultivar, which reaches only eight to 10 feet in height. Our third native tree is bald cypress, 
Taxodium disticum. Uh, this is a deciduous conifer, hence the uh, term bald. Another tall tree, a very long lived rot resistant one. Uh, this grows in similar conditions and uh, tolerates flooded conditions, clay, even strong winds and air pollution and deer will seldom severely damage the tree. This provides food and nesting sites for wildlife and is the larval host for a sphinx moth. Bald cypress has a trunk with a flared or fluted base. And this is one that has the so-called nematophores, the knobby knees. Um, these will get to be even maybe a, a foot or so tall when they're growing in boggy conditions like the, pictured here. The tree has uh, interesting fibrous bark and beautiful feathery foliage, it's very soft. And this foliage will turn from orange to cinnamon color in the fall before the little needles drop. It has green wrinkled cones that will mature to brown with seeds inside. This particular tree tolerates a wide range of soil, but uh, soils that are too alkaline can cause chlorosis, that yellowing that I mentioned earlier that results as a lack of chlorophyll. This is a low maintenance tree with easy fall cleanup, and it may develop knees in the lawns, nothing like the knees you would see in the boggy conditions. This particular tree pictured here at the Glen Carlin Demonstration Garden has just begun developing some very low um, patches of, of woody knees in the lawn. This can be used as an ornamental lawn tree near water, in wet areas, or in large rain gardens. Our next tree is Sweet Bay Magnolia, Magnolia virginiana. This is an evergreen to semi-evergreen tree, depending upon the harshness of the winter weather, much shorter than the previous trees, only reaching 12 to 30 feet in height. And it often, again, is a multi-stem tree. It has a rounded crown. It grows in similar conditions to those described before. And this one also tolerates occasional flooding, shade, air pollution, and some degree of salt. Deer may de damage this tree more in southerly regions. Birds and other wildlife consume the seeds and it is the larval host to swallowtail butterflies and moths. It has four season interest with shiny green foliage and very large lemon scented flowers from May to June. In the summer, you'll see these cone-like fruits maturing and then uh, these bright colored seeds will be revealed that are enjoyed by wildlife. And through the seasons, you'll see smooth, lightly scented bark. This tree does well in clay soil and it tolerates wet and boggy soil as well. It's best established in part shade in either the spring or the fall, and you'll want to uh, continue watering and mulching it in order uh, to give it a good establishment. Now this, like the uh, southern, much larger southern magnolia, has very leathery leaves that are slow to disintegrate. And you can actually use those persisting fall leaves as a mulch unless they're diseased, in which case you would want to dispose of those in the trash. This tree can be used as a specimen in foundation plantings, in wet areas or in the center of a large rain garden. Now we'll turn to some shrubs. The first is button bush, Cephalanthus occidentalis. This is a deciduous tree with a round, excuse me, deciduous shrub with a rounded form, six to 12 feet in height. It uh, likes similar conditions to those of the trees and it can actually tolerate floods up to 36 inches and salty conditions as well. And it's very intolerant of drought. Deer will occasionally severely damage this. Bees, butterflies, hummingbirds will seek the nectar and songbirds will consume the fruit 
and it also serves as the larval host for multiple moths. Buttonbush has very attractive glossy leaves and distinctive fuzzy fragrant flowers looking almost like little mini satellites, very uh, attractive to pollinators early to midsummer. And these will eventually develop into these ball-like fruits and they will linger on as dried nutlets in the winter. Button bush can actually grow in standing water and it does its best flowering in full sun. This is a fast growing shrub, so it can actually be heavily pruned every two to three years to revitalize it or to control its size. And you would want to do that reshaping in the spring, removing any dead growth. Buttonbush can be naturalized in woodland areas, used in shrub borders, in large rain gardens, or at pond edges. Our next shrub is sweet pepperbush, Clethra alnifolia, another deciduous shrub with a rounded form, the same height, six to 12 feet in height. It tolerates clay, dense shade, and salt and deer will seldom severely damage it. This shrub attracts bees, hummingbirds, and butterflies, and bees and small mammals enjoy its fruit. Sweet pepper bush has intensely scented flowers in July and August, and these will eventually develop um, into fruit capsules from September to January. And I should mention, uh, the straight species of sweet pepper bush has white flowers, but the ruby spice cultivar, cultivar has these beautiful pink spires of flowers. Now those fruit capsules that I mentioned will actually linger on as an interesting winter feature. Clethra has quilted foliage and it will turn a brilliant golden color in the fall. This plant grows in full sun, but it actually prefers dappled shade. It can sucker to form colonies as shown here where it's been allowed to grow as a hedge. But if you wish, you can remove the root suckers as they appear to contain any spread. Now this particular shrub blooms on new growth. So you'll want to do any pruning in the late winter before those flower buds form. There are compact cultivars available, and one of them is hummingbird, which is only two to four feet in height. You can use sweet pepper bush in borders, near foundations, in butterfly or hummer gardens, and to control erosion. Our next shrub is inkberry, Ilex glabra. This is one of our native hollies. It, it is also one of our few native evergreen plants, and it has a rounded to open form, six to 10 feet in height. This one uh, prefers uh, acidic soil. It will tolerate some shade, dry soil, air pollution, and some salt, and deer will seldom severely damage it. It attracts bees to its nectar and birds to its fruit, and provides cover for wildlife. It's a plant with four season interest, beginning with these glossy leathery leaves. In the spring, it sends out these small flowers. Uh, for us, they're relatively uh, unnoticeable, but they're very attractive to pollinators and uh, bees will be attracted to uh, produce gallberry honey from the nectar. The fruit that forms from September to March uh, is on the female plants. This is a so-called dioecious plant. That means that there are separate flowers on male and female plants. And if you want to have fruit, you would plant one male with at least one female. This particular plant really dislikes alkaline soil and you'll also want to protect it from harsh winter exposure. Another plant that flowers on new growth, 
So you'll want to prune to shape it uh, later in the spring. And it's a desirable alternative to finicky boxwood that many people are discovering is, is suffering from boxwood blight. Uh, this particular shrub can be used in borders, as a hedge, along foundations, or for erosion control. Another uh, of our native hollies is winterberry, Ilex verticillata. Now this particular one is a deciduous holly and it has a rounded form reaching six to 12 feet in height. It tolerates clay, shade and air pollution and deer may occasionally damage it. This particular shrub is notable because it provides food and cover for 48 different bird species, having a, a very nutritious fruit. It has quilted foliage and uh, again, very small white flowers, June to July. And this is another of the dioecious species. So you'll want to plant matched pairs of male and female plants. This example here shows red sprite, a female plant that's matched with Jim Dandy, the male. And these plants are ideally matched because they will bloom at the same time and the pollen can be transferred from one plant to the, to the male plant to the female. Uh, fruit will form on the female plants late in August to September. And as I mentioned, it's a very nutritious uh, late fall fruit, for, especially for our migrating birds. Uh, a, an example of an orange uh, fruiting plant is this one, uh, winter gold, which would be matched with the male Southern gentleman. Winterberry does its best flowering and fruiting when sighted in full sun, but you may want to provide partial shade at midday uh, if you have uh, particularly hot areas of your garden. You can plant one male with up to 10 females. And as I mentioned, you'll want to match paired cultivars that will be blooming at the same time. Another example of a, a shrub that blooms on new growth. So you would uh, prune this in the very early spring. You can use it as a hedge in a rain garden or to control erosion. Our next shrub is Virginia Sweet Spire, Itea virginica, a deciduous shrub with an arching to rounded habit, six to 10 feet in height. This one tolerates clay, dense shade, uh, I've seen it uh, in the understory of forests, and it can tolerate flooding also to six inches. Deer may damage this plant when their other favorite foods are gone. It attracts a wide uh, variety of pollinators for the nectar and provides food, nesting, and cover for birds. Virginia Sweet Spire has these beautiful white flowers in drooping clusters from May to June. And uh, when pollinated, these will develop fruit capsules that remain on the plant from June through till March. It has a beautiful flaming fall color, uh, a perfect substitute for burning bush, non-native invasive burning bush. And there are cultivars available uh, at different heights. One example is Henry's Garnet at three to five feet, and Little Henry at two to three feet. Virginia Sweet Spire does best when planted in sun uh, to allow for uh, bountiful flowering and colorful fall foliage. And you'll want to keep it well watered in its first year, but once it's established, it can actually tolerate dry conditions. If needed, you would want to prune this in the early summer after it has done its flowering. You can use it as a foundation plant as pictured here, as a hedge, at a water's edge, or in woodlands, or to control erosion. Our next shrub is highbush blueberry, Vaccinium corymbosum. Uh, a deciduous upright spreading plant, six to 12 feet in height. It uh, especially will need acidic soil. It tolerates wet soil 
And unfortunately, deer and rabbits may damage this plant, especially in the winter. Highbush blueberry attracts bees to its nectar. Birds will enjoy the berries, and it also serves as the larval host to various Lepidoptera. It's a, a very ornamental plant with bell-shaped flowers just starting to form now uh, from April to June, uh, an enjoyable edible fruit for us as well as for wildlife. It has glossy oval leaves and these will turn brilliant colors in the fall. Perhaps the most important uh, tip as far as uh, care for blueberry is that this plant requires a soil that is quite acidic, 4.0 to 5. Uh, neutral, most plants grow in the, the neutral range around 6 to 7. So this de definitely needs the, the more acidic soil. For its best fruiting crop, you'll want to plant more than one variety with the same bloom time. And the recommendation is to actually remove the flowers to promote good growth during the first two years. And then you can begin pruning it as needed uh, in late winter, beginning in the plant's third year. Blueberry can be used in a, excuse me, in a shrub border as a hedge uh, at the edge of a woodland garden. One of my favorite native viburnums is possum haw, viburnum nudum. This is a deciduous multi-stemmed plant with a, a spreading habit, and it reaches about five to 12 feet in height. Another one that generally prefers acidic soil, although it can tolerate a, a range of soil types. Deer may occasionally browse on the twigs and the leaves. Bees will seek the pollen and fruits will be eaten by the birds and lar it's a larval host for the spring azure butterfly. Possum haw is another plant with multi-season interest. It has beautiful white flowers in wide flat top clusters. Uh, I'm just seeing the buds on my plants now. These will widen out and develop uh, from May to June. It has the uh, most lustrous uh, glossy leaves of all the viburnums and they're somewhat leathery in texture. And they again will turn a stunning color in the fall. Possum haw is especially noted for its multicolored fruit that ripens from July to October. The fruit actually begins with kind of a, a minty green color, then will turn pink and purple and blue and you'll often see uh, clusters of fruit with multiple colors, very striking. Possum haw, again, does its best fruit production when you have genetically varied plants. So you'll want to buy them and plant them in groups that you've uh, obtained from multiple suppliers. Uh, it's not going to need much pruning. You'd only prune it lightly as needed in the fall. Possum haw can be used in borders, at woodland edges, in low spots, in rain gardens, and by streams or ponds. Colleen, do we have any questions regarding our trees and shrubs? Yes, we do, Elaine, and we have a lot of questions that I'm going to save for you for later that are more germane later on. But Excellent. Um, there was a question about which trees are fast growing. One of the um, participants mentioned they had a bald cypress that grew two or three feet in a year, but do you, are any of the other trees fast growing? Yes, the other example of a particularly fast growing tree is the river birch, Betula nigra. Okay, thank you. Um, is there a way to tell a bald cypress from a dawn redwood? Uh, I am not particularly knowledgeable in that, in that regard, I'm sorry. Okay, I guess they could get in touch with the help desk. That would be a good suggestion. And I'll try to do a little research on that as well and, and respond with the, the document that will uh, be posted along with the recording okay. of, of this presentation. I know they look very similar. Um, there were several questions on inkberry and winterberry. 
Um, you mentioned that the females have berries in the fall. Is there a way to tell male from female at other times of the year? Uh, the flowers look a, a little bit different. The, the female flowers, as I recall, have a green center. And of course, you'll see the anthers with the pollen on them on the, on the male plants. Now, okay. I, ideally, when you shop for these plants at a nursery, that nursery will have marked them specifically as to whether they're male or female. You would, if, if lacking that, you would ideally shop during the, during the spring when the flowers were, were blooming and you could see that distinction in the flowers. And of course, if you were lucky on the female plants, you would, would see the, the fruit if you were shopping and purchasing them in the fall. But uh, lack of fruit doesn't necessarily mean that they, that they aren't female. They just, the fruit, the, the flowers may not have been pollinated. Okay. Um, there were a couple of questions on how close to plant uh, winterberry and inkberry, or I guess how far away can they be planted and still succeed? Uh, oh, so, th so that the pollination takes place. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I believe uh, it, it's within about 40 feet. I think that's the, 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 the farthest apart that I would plant them. Uh, in my particular garden, I've actually found it most attractive to plant them as a as a cluster so for example with with the winterberry the uh, one pictured here uh, I have it I have four different plants one male and three females okay and in in our uh, demonstration gardens we generally have them side by side but but you could have them planted at at that 40 foot distance and the pollination would still ideally take place Okay, thank you. Um, there were a couple of questions about, um, you mentioned several cultivars and are these just as attractive to birds and pollinators? Yes, so let's see, we were talking, one example was um, with, the, with the clethra, the, uh, the sweet pepper bush. The, those particular flowers, the flowers of the ruby spice are pink and they seem to, to be equally attractive. Uh, a lot of the thinking is that it's ideally best to go with the straight species. We know that uh, our pollinators have evolved with, with the straight species of plants for many uh, hundreds of years, if not thousands of years. And so those will, will assuredly provide really uh, good support for those for those pollinators. But, but uh, in, in that particular example, I, I think the ruby spice does a good job as well. Okay. Um, you mentioned that inkberry likes acidic soil. Can it also be grown in wet clay? Uh, yes, I think that was one that, that did, uh, did well in the, in the wetter conditions. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, do you have any advice for the best replacement for Nandina? Uh, the best replacement for Nandina that I think has a very similar open airy habit is not one that I'm mentioning here. It is a strawberry bush, sometimes referred to as hearts abustin. This is uh, one of the native Euonymus, Euonymus americanus. And uh, you can find a fact sheet for that plant on the MGNV website. I didn't single it out because it, it wasn't one for especially wet conditions. I think it, I think it prefers uh, moist conditions. I, it grows naturally in a forest understory and it has uh, very charming pale yellow flowers in the spring. They're just starting to appear on my plants now. And it has an absolutely stunning fruit that forms uh, with brilliant raspberry and day glow orange, uh, in my estimation, equal to any Nandina berries. <laughs> okay. Um, someone mentioned they live by four mile uh, run and have seen ash trees there. Um, any hints about taking care of those or fostering them or? Uh, I'll need to do a little research on that and I'll be happy to respond to that question in my written comments. Okay. I think that's good for now, Elaine, thank you. Okay, we'll move on. Now we'll be looking at some perennials. 
The first of our best bets perennials is swamp milkweed, Asclepius incarnata. This is a loose clumping plant and usually you'll see it in a multi-stemmed form, reaching four to six feet in height. This one likes sun to part shade and as we've seen with so many of these plants, moist to wet conditions. Now this is one that will actually tolerate temporary flooding, although it can uh, handle some drought once it's established and deer will seldom severely damage it. This is especially attractive to native bees and other butterflies and is one of several native, uh, monarch, uh, native milkweeds that serve as larval hosts for the monarch butterfly. Swamp milkweed has flat clusters of fragrant flowers, as you can see, very attractive to these uh, bees. It has lance-shaped leaves. And as I mentioned, this is a plant that's going to support the full life cycle of the monarch butterfly. Adults, both male and female, will uh, feed on the nectar and then the females will uh, lay their eggs uh, for the ca caterpillars to use as nourishment for that generation. And then you'll see these tear-shaped seed follicles with airborne seeds in the summer and fall. Now, swamp milkweed is a plant that can spread both by those airborne seeds and by underground rhizomes. If you want to control the spread of the plant, you would remove any unwanted shoots from the root area and those seed follicles before they split and, uh, and re reveal the seeds. Now, an important thing to note if you want to support monarchs is that there, if there is any dead foliage, you'll only want to remove that after frost because it may harbor some monarch eggs or larvae on the undersides. And especially important to note is that this is an excellent substitute for non-native and invasive butterfly bush, which only provides nectar, but no nourishment for the caterpillar stage of the monarchs. Uh, you can use this plant in butterfly gardens, bogs, and rain or water gardens. Our next best bet perennial is white turtle head, Chelone glabra. This is an upright clump forming plant about one to four feet in height. This will tolerate erosion, wet soil, and even some temporary flooding. And unfortunately, deer will occasionally severely damage it. It attracts uh, a wide range of pollinators as well as hummingbirds, and it's the larval host for the Baltimore checker spot butterfly. Turtlehead is a very robust plant. It has lance-shaped leaves on stout, erect stems. And these very interesting hooded two-lipped flowers from July to October. Some people may have seen uh, Chelone leonii, which is a pink flowered form that is actually native a little uh, further to the west. You can see how popular this is with bumblebees. They are strong enough to pry apart those lips and uh, tuck inside to get the pollen and the nectar. Uh, when the flowers are pollinated, they'll form these uh, tall ovoid seed capsules. This is a plant where you'll want to maintain good air circulation and soil moisture for the plant to prevent mildew and provide mulch in sunny areas to retain moisture. As you can see, this plant can become somewhat leggy in the shade. And if necessary, you could stake it or you could also pinch back the stems in the spring to reduce the overall mature height. You can use this in shade, woodland, bog, or rain gardens. Our next perennial is coastal plain joe pie weed, Eutrochium dubium. This is a tall upright plant with uh, unbranched stems. And this is a, one of the shorter of the very tall joe pie weeds at two to five feet in height. It tolerates clay and wet soil 
and deer will rarely damage it. It attracts a variety of bees and butterflies. Songbirds will enjoy the seeds that develop and it also serves as the larval host to various moths. This is a plant with multi-season interest. It has these very interesting uh, ovate leaves that are arranged in whorls on purple speckled stems. And the flowers grow in large dome-shaped clusters from July to October. That dome shape makes a, a perfect landing pad for pollinators, especially the uh, delicate butterflies. And the pollinated flowers will form these fluffy seed heads in the fall. You'll want to retain these as uh, food for the birds. And they will also be very attractive with uh, snow and ice in the wintertime. This is a plant where you can control the height by pinching it back early in the growing season. I may actually pinch it back several times as it grows. Uh, because of the wide diameter of the stems, this is a perfect example of a plant where you would retain the stems through the winter for overwintering bees. And then you could cut those back to 12 inches in the spring. Then those uh, stems would in turn be used in the next growing year. If you want to, you could consider a somewhat shorter cultivar, the little joe, which grows three to four feet. Uh, this plant, and I see that I've uh, mislabeled it here. It's not a purple coneflower. It's uh, the joe pie weed. Uh, you can use it in borders, cottage gardens, uh, in naturalized areas, or in the central part of rain gardens. Our next pair of perennials are the blue flag irises, iris versicolor, uh, that's referred to as the northern blue flag, and iris virginica in the south. Now, the northern variety grows from Virginia northward uh, on the east coast, and southern uh, blue flag uh, grows throughout the, uh, the east coast and especially in the southeast. It's an upright clumping plant reaching about one to three feet in height, uh, prefers sun and humusy acidic soil. It can tolerate clay, a certain degree of flooding and light shade and deer and rabbits will rarely damage it. This plant attracts bees, butterflies, skippers, as well as hummingbirds. It has sword-shaped basal leaves that will rise up from shallow roots. And these lovely showy flowers on tall stalks from May to July. They have violet blue petals with darker purple veins and these lovely yellow and white crested falls. And as you can see, they're very attractive to hummingbirds. You'll want to keep the blue flag irises moist from spring through fall, and they can actually be grown in standing water up to six inches. They'll spread slowly to form colonies, and you'll want to divide them when they become overcrowded and uh, have reduced flowering. You'll propagate them by clump division early in the fall when the leaves begin to wither. And it's a good idea to wear gloves to uh, prevent any skin irritation from handling them. You can use blue flag irises along a water's edge, in a water garden, in a rain garden, or anywhere that's consistently moist to wet. Next, I'd like to introduce you to two lobelias. Lobelia cardinalis, cardinal flower, is the red flowering variety, and Lobelia syphilitica is great blue Lobelia. These both grow with thick, rigid, erect stems in clumps. Cardinal flower reaches about two to four feet in height, and great blue Lobelia about one to five feet. They both like the same sun and moisture conditions and humus rich soil and they'll tolerate wet soil and rabbits. And deer will seldom severely damage them except for young plants. 
Native bees use the nectar and the pollen and butterflies and hummingbirds will come seeking nectar. Both types of lobelias will grow from these basal rosettes and then reach out with unbranched leafy stems. They have tubular two-lipped flowers that grow in spike-like racemes from August to October, and those will form seed heads in the fall. Cardinal flower is a short-lived plant, so you'll want to allow it to self-seed to continue in your garden. A great blue lobelia, Lobelia syphilitica, may also self-seed to form colonies. And you can divide clumps of them by separating the, any basal offshoots in the spring or the fall. This is important to note, you don't want to cover those low basal leaves with mulch over the winter. Those will, that will cause them to, to rot out. You can use both of the lobelias in woodland gardens, in rain gardens, near ponds and streams. Our next perennial, uh, uh, perhaps a familiar one, is Virginia bluebells, Mertensia virginica. This is an erect clump forming plant about 12 to 30 inches in height. And it tolerates rabbits and black walnut, but is intolerant of waterlogged soil in the winter. Now, the important thing to note about this is that is an ephemeral plant, so it is going to go dormant in the summer months. When it's in bloom, it will attract bees, butterflies, moths, and hummers, and will provide cover for wildlife. Bluebells have large floppy leaves and multicolored buds, and these will open up into bell-shaped flowers that are long blooming. They usually are blue in color, but there will be some color variety, uh, even pink and white. And then the pollinated flowers will form nuts with seeds in the summer. Bluebells can spread to form colonies, but as I pointed out, they are ephemeral, so the foliage will die back in the summer. That means that you're going to want to interplant them with later spreading perennials to fill the void. So an examples would be some uh, native uh, shade loving ground covers and ferns. And you will plant bluebells about 10 to 18 inches apart in the fall, or if you wait until the spring, you would uh, do it after the last spring frost. Bluebells can be used along woodland paths, in shady borders, by a pond or in rain gardens. Our next perennial is scarlet bee balm, Monarda didyma, a clump forming plant two to four feet in height. This tolerates rabbits, clay, and black walnut, but is intolerant of dry soil. Another of the Monardas, uh, Monarda fistulosa, uh, is more suited to dry soil conditions. And deer will seldom severely damage this plant. It's very attractive to hummingbirds, butterflies, and bees. Scarlet bee balm has very showy flowers from May to July and minty scented leaves on square stems. It can colonize both by rhizomes and seed. One way to prolong the bloom would be to deadhead it and this is important, you'll want to provide good circulation around the plants to prevent a powdery mildew. And if any mildewed stems form, uh, you'll want to cut those off at the base and place those in the trash rather than in your compost. You might want to consider some uh, resistant cultivars. And uh, one example is the Jacob Klein cultivar. You can divide this plant every three years to control its spread. Uh, it is uh, in the mint family and uh, so that it will spread, but if you keep it under control, it, it should do very well for you. You can use it in herb, butterfly, native flower and rain gardens. Our next perennial is rough stemmed goldenrod, Solidago rugosa, 
It's a clumping, sturdy plant with erect stems. And I'm particularly singling out the fireworks cultivar, which has a very attractive habit, uh, two to three feet in height. This one will tolerate clay and light shade and deer seldom severely damage it. Unfortunately, much of the public is concerned. They assume that goldenrod, the fall blooming goldenrods, are the plants that cause fall allergies, but this is not the case. It's actually ragweed, which has inconspicuous flowers and is wind pollinated that causes that fall hay fever. Goldenrod is in fact pollinated by beneficial insects. It requires them for pollination because the pollen is uh, moist and sticky and uh, can't be carried by the wind. Goldenrod is a larval host to many moths and birds enjoy its seeds. Rough-stemmed goldenrod has narrow toothed leaves. And this is another example of a plant where you would pinch back those growing tips to control the height. Uh, one of my favorite resources is this book, The Well-Tended Perennial Garden, which gives tips on this uh, pinching back or pruning for control. It's by Tracy de Sabato Ost. And uh, I'm hoping that our facilitators can put the link for this in uh, the chat box. Goldenrod has tiny composite flowers on arching stems that bloom for quite a long time from August to November. Uh, excellent late pollen uh, a nectar source for our pollinators and then it will form these seeds in the fall. As I mentioned, you can pinch this back several times in the spring up to the 4th of July and remove uh, flowers to encourage root rebloom. Now, this particular plant uh, can spread aggressively from rhizomes and may also self seed. So you'll want to divide it every two to three years. It can be used in mixed borders, meadows, butterfly gardens, rain gardens, and at the water's edge. Blue vervain, verbena hastata, uh, is a very graceful plant, a clump forming erect plant. It ranges in height anywhere from 18 inches up to five feet. And it actually tolerates temporary standing water and on the, and on the other extreme, moderate drought. Deer seldom severely damage it and rabbits may eat the young foliage, unfortunately. It attracts many beneficial insects, is the larval host for verbena moth, and birds enjoy its seeds. It has long narrow leaves on stout square stems and small tubular flowers on these lovely candelabra-like spikes. These will be in bloom for quite a long period from June to October and then they will form nutlets in the fall. Blue vervain is a, a hardy plant with no known pests or diseases. And another example of a plant where you could pinch off the tops during the growing season that would encourage it to branch and have a bushier growth habit. It can be short lived, but it can self seed and can spread slowly by rhizomes to form colonies. You can use a blue vervain in mixed borders, meadows, rain gardens, near streams, and ponds. Now we'll take a look at some best bets ferns for wet conditions. The first is royal fern, Osmunda spectabilis. It's a deciduous fern, very tall, uh, two to six feet in height. It likes uh, part shade to full shade moist to wet conditions in humus rich acidic soil. This plant will actually tolerate dense shade, brief flooding. It can handle some sun as long as you provide sufficient moisture. Deer will rarely damage it. The, the clumps of royal fern provide cover for wildlife. In the spring, you'll see uh, unfurling fronds and these will develop into sterile fronds, 
with a rounded, well-separated leaflets. Then on the fertile fronds, you'll see these green sponge-like sporangia and these tassel-like fertile clusters will mature to a bronze. Now the fiddleheads of royal fern were once eaten, but they are now considered to be carcinogenic. At this point, the only uh, fiddleheads considered to be edible are those of ostrich fern. Royal fern can reach up to six feet in height with constant moisture. Its foliage will turn yellow or brown in the fall, and it can spread slowly by rhizomes. And I was interested to learn that these rhizomes are actually used as the fiber for potting orchids. Royal fern can add a graceful accent to woodland edges, rain gardens, and pond borders. Another fern for wet conditions is cinnamon fern, Osmondostrum cinnamomeum. Another deciduous fern, this one grows in a vase-shaped clump, two to three feet in height. Again, it prefers part shade to shade and humus-rich acidic soil. This one can tolerate dense shade and rabbits and deer will rarely damage it. Cinnamon fern provides nesting material for birds and cover for wildlife when colonies form. This is a look at the woolly fiddleheads. And then these wand-like fertile fronds will mature to the characteristic cinnamon brown. The spores that are released by those fertile fronds will be carried both by wind and water. And they are surrounded by the sterile fronds in a vase-like cluster. Those sterile fronds will turn vibrant colors in the fall. This is an excellent fern for a beginning gardener. It can reach five feet tall with sufficient moisture. And uh, again, has a massive rootstock and those fibrous roots uh, can hold the soil in place. Another one where the root fiber is used for potting orchids. You could use this as a dramatic accent plant in mixed borders, in woodlands, rain gardens, or at a water's edge. And finally, we'll take a look at some grasses, sedges, and rushes that are particularly adapted to wet conditions. The first is a common rush, and this is the only plant uh, on the best bets plant sheet that has no separate tried and true fact sheet. This is common rush, Juncus effusus. It's an evergreen clumping plant. It's vase shaped. It reaches two to four feet in height by two to three feet wide. Now this one really prefers full sun and very wet conditions. It will tolerate part shade, definitely wet soil, even standing water and erosion and it's generally unpalatable to deer. Rushes can provide food and cover for birds. Although they look bristly, the uh, unbranched stems of common rush are actually very soft. So its second common name is soft rush. The stems are cylindrical in shape and they are leafless. The, the leaves are reduced down to sheaths at the base. Common rush has one-sided clusters of flowers from July to September, and the tiny seeds that are released from the flowers will be carried by wind and water. The plant can also spread by rhizomes. As I mentioned, common rush grows best in full sun and it can tolerate up to four inches of standing water. This means that if you're planting it elsewhere, you, it's going to need to be uh, watered during extended dry periods. It can be grown both in the ground or in containers, and you'll want to cut back any old foliage in the spring. 
You can use it in rain gardens. Here it is the, the golden colored plant pictured in the center of this rain garden. Uh, low spots uh, on slopes and you can use it to control erosion on moist banks. It also is a dramatic specimen plant either for the garden or uh, ground in the garden or a container. Switchgrass, Panicum virgatum, is a warm season grass with a clumping vase shape. It reaches anywhere from three to six feet in height. There are many uh, cultivars available on the market. It grows in sun to part shade and tolerates occasional flooding as well as drought, erosion, black walnut, and deer will rarely damage it. It's a good food source and cover for wildlife and the foliage serves as a larval host for skippers and satyrs. As I mentioned, switchgrass is a warm season grass. That means that it will begin growth slowly in the spring and it will put on most of its growth uh, in the late summer uh, and the arching leaves will eventually reach 24 inches long. Now there are a variety of cultivars that have some color variation to the foliage. This particular one is Shenandoah. All of the switchgrass plants uh, are characterized by these airy pink tinged uh, inflorescences. They appear above the foliage in July and the plant as a whole will take on a coppery winter hue. Switchgrass has uh, an especially deep root system uh, up to 10 feet deep, which really helps to stabilize soil. This was one of the primary plants uh, in, the, in the tall grass prairies of the Midwest, although it is native here on the East Coast as well. Uh, it's notable because it retains its architectural structure through the winter. It can spread to form colonies and grows best in full sun. You'll want to definitely avoid excess shade or it will become floppy. And it also flops in overly rich soils. It prefers a drier soil, uh, excuse me, leaner soil. Uh, you'll want to cut this back uh, to eight inches in the late winter or early spring before it begins that new burst of growth. Switchgrass is adaptable to a wide variety of landscape uses. Here we're showing it as an accent plant in the archway uh, at Glen Carlin Demonstration Garden. It can be used en masse for screening uh, in the surrounding uh, border area of a rain garden, on slopes for erosion control, and it's also attractive as the central thriller component of container plantings. Uh, to give you a little information on resources, I am a member of the Arlington Alexandra unit of Master Gardeners. And uh, my colleagues and I have all been trained by Virginia Cooperative Extension. That allows us to share science-based information from our two land-grant universities, Virginia Tech and Virginia State University. And we've been doing that since 1985. We do that in a number of ways. As Leslie mentioned at the outset of the presentation, we have a, a functioning help desk uh, you won't be able to come physically to our location at Fairlington at the present time, but you can see our uh, email address and all of your gardening related questions will be thoroughly researched uh, and you will get a response from our master gardeners. Uh, we hope to resume with plant clinics when it becomes uh, safe. We also have quite a number of demonstration gardens and you can see the locations for these on our master gardener website mgnv.org. Uh, of course, we offer many classes at, at present via the Zoom medium. And these, you can see the recordings of these classes on the MGNV website under the uh, public education tab. Uh, Virginia Cooperative Extension is supported in our area by Master Gardeners of Northern Virginia, a nonprofit group. And as I mentioned, we have a website as well as a regular posts on uh, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. 
uh, some suggestions of where you might look to see native plants. Uh, in the upper left is uh, our sunny garden, one of our de demonstration gardens. In the center uh, is the Nature Conservancy pocket garden behind their headquarters in Arlington. Meadowlark Botanical Gardens is an excellent location in uh, Virginia and the U.S. National Arboretum and the U.S. Botanic Garden in D.C. are great locations uh, in this particular region. As far as where to buy native plants, I strongly recommend that you refer to the Plant Nova Natives website. They have a, a page that will list native only sellers. Some of them are right here in the uh, Northern Virginia area, some a little further afield. For those of you who are attending from uh, further abroad, I will try to list uh, some other resources uh, in, the, in the written notes that will be accompanying the recording. And finally, uh, the second class in the Best Bet series will be presented on May 21 at the same time, 10 to 11.30. This will be best plants for, uh, for dry conditions. Do we have any concluding questions, Colleen? Yes, indeed we do. Um, there was a question, uh, do you have a recommended list of plants for four season interest in rain gardens? Well, I've in the presentation, I've tried to uh, to highlight the ones that that are especially good. I guess the any if you decided to use any of, of the woody plants, because those are going to have beautiful flowers. They're going to have colorful fruit, and uh, and a number of them will have a very colorful foliage. The ones I mentioned uh, would be Virginia sweet spire. The, uh, the possum ha viburnum and uh, the, the high bush blueberry. Those are especially notable for their fall foliage. Um, let's see, looking at the perennials, uh, those, those are not going to have the four season interest because those are all, they're perennials, but they're going to, to die back and set out the new growth in the spring. But you will have uh, interest pretty much through three seasons, um, spring and summer when they're flowering, and then interesting seed heads. And some of those seed heads uh, will linger on into the winter months. Uh, for example, the Joe Pye weed has those beautiful uh, domed flowers that turn into interesting domed seed heads. Okay, that's a great list. Thank you, Elaine. Um, there were a couple of questions about do you have uh, recommendations of plants to put at the base of downspouts um, to handle those conditions? Okay, um, really a lot of these, these plants um, I, I've singled out because they can handle the moisture. You would want to have a plant that would have a deep enough root system that it could handle the, the flow of, of water. Mm -hmm. uh, one example, would be that rush, the common rush. That one, as I mentioned, can actually grow in standing water and its, its tenacious root system allows it to handle even uh, flooding, you know, torrential flooding conditions. Um, a plant that I've seen mentioned as, as doing well uh, at, at the bottom of a, of a downspout would be the, um, Lobelia cardinalis, the, uh, the cardinal flower. I've, I've seen that grow as long as there aren't you know, big torrents of, of rain coming down. Yeah, great. Um, how about, there was a question about irises and are blue flag irises the only irises that you could recommend for a rain garden? Uh, the, those are the ones that, that I'm familiar with because, because they're native in our area. I guess there was a question earlier about the removal of the invasive uh, yeah. yellow uh, variety. Right. Um, I, I wonder if, if the question is referring to any of the non-native irises, such as the uh, German irises, for example. And okay. 
I don't, I don't know about the moisture conditions for those. I don't grow them in particularly wet uh, spots in, in my garden, but I can, I can look further into that. Um, the dwarf crested iris is another type of, of native iris. We have a separate fact sheet for that. People would find that under the listing of ground covers on, on, our, uh, on our website. But I don't know that that one is particularly singled out as, as handling especially wet conditions. I've, I've got it growing in, in forest conditions that, that aren't especially wet myself. Now, speaking of ground covers, I did not have, a, this Best Bets fact sheet doesn't have a separate section on ground covers. And one ground cover that can handle uh, wet conditions is Pacara aurea. Uh, that is golden ragwort. And people can look for a fact sheet for that, uh, a tried and true fact sheet on the website under ground covers. Golden ragwort is actually interesting because it can handle a very wide range of soil moisture and light conditions. And if you wanted to use any of these other plants as ground covers, um, of course, the Virginia bluebells could be a short term ground cover until the summer months. Uh, the white turtle head doesn't grow particularly tall. Um, Lobelia cardinalis, some of those grow you know, two to four feet. And then the, the ferns, of course, could be a very nice ground cover as well. Okay, thank you. That's nice information. There was a question about whether uh, cardinal flowers self seed in the rain garden. And another question about are there any of these plants that you can start through seeds? Okay. Um, the, the, as I mentioned, Lobelia cardinalis, actually both of the Lobelias will self seed. So I, I think it should, should do that both in a regular garden beds as, as well as in the rain garden. Okay. Now, I personally do not grow plants from, from seeds. So I'm not as knowledgeable about that. And most of the sellers that I'm aware of, the, the native only plant sellers, are going to, to offer either plugs or, uh, or, or full grown garden plants that will be available in, in, a, in pots in a, in a range of sizes. But I can look further into that and try to provide a little more information again when I respond to the chat box questions. Okay, thanks, Elaine. And the final question someone asked about uh, do deer like milkweed? Uh, I, I think, I, as I recall, milkweed was one of the ones that, that they're not going to be uh, eating as much. There are three different types of, uh, actually four types of milkweed, I think, that are locally native. Uh, the, the one that I singled out is the, uh, the swamp milkweed, Asclepius incarnata. The other two are Asclepius syriaca, which is the common milkweed. That is a very robust plant. And I think both because of the stoutness of the stem and really for all of them, they, they have that latex uh, type of sap that makes them uh, unpalatable to deer. The shorter milkweed is Asclepius tuberosa. That is an orange flowering plant. And that's one that I will actually be featuring in the best bets for dry conditions. There's another plant, uh, a white flowering plant called whorled milkweed, another one that's supportive of, uh, of the monarchs. Okie doke. That's it for the questions, Elaine. And thank you for once again, a fantastic presentation. We've already had lots of thank yous and comments. So appreciate it. Excellent. Good luck to all of you with your gardening this spring. And I'll look forward to seeing some of you back again for the presentation, Best Bets for Dry Conditions in May. Thank you, everybody. Thank you again, Elaine, and a special thanks to Colleen Kennedy and Cheryl Lay, who've done a wonderful job today helping with our question and answer and taking care of um, things in the chat box for us. So have a great weekend, everybody.